It's like the curse of creative people. The ideas come to you when you can't do nothing about it. This is the Techsploder podcast, conversations with tech professionals about being human in a binary world. Episode 18, Doc Rock. Techsploder is made possible by the financial support of our patrons like Mark Elzia. If you like what you hear, head on over to patreon.com slash Jason Howell to support the show directly. And thank you for making independent podcasting possible. Hello, welcome to the Techsploder podcast. I'm Jason Howell, and each week I get to sit down with some of my friends in the world of technology and get to know them a little bit better and get a better understanding of how technology has impacted their lives, not just like from a resume perspective, but, you know, like what are the early situations, the early experiences around technology that really formulated and really created this passion of tech? We all have those stories, right? That's what the Techsploder podcast is all about. And today's guest is my friend, Doc Rock. Most people know him, of course, as Doc. His real name is Sean Boyd, although it sounds like nobody calls him that anymore. He's an incredibly talented media professional. He actually serves as director of strategic partnerships at Ecamm Network. They're the creators of the live streaming software platform by the same name. Doc got his start as an Apple genius way, way back when, but has since donned many hats, including contributor to the unofficial Apple weblog, content creator on YouTube, which is what many people know him for, and even acting, which is something he's done since childhood. I had no idea. Most recently, Doc released his own line of microphone pop filters called Doc Pops. We talked about that a little bit at the end of the uh, interview as well, so stay tuned for that. But Doc Rock is here to talk all about his history and his life in tech. So let's get right into the conversation with Doc. You know what we were talking about yesterday on This Week in Tech? Uh, the compact eye pack. How we got oh, the eye pack, I have no idea. <laughs> but we got to talking it. about the eye pack and like using the trio, you know, back in the day. And yeah. it's so funny because the, the smartphone is such a thing now that we don't even really call it smartphones. Weird, weird marketing no. people say that, but we just call it our phone. Yeah, and it's a phone now. For the most part, we're not using the phone side of it, we're using everything else. But, you know, going back into that Palm Pilot Trio days and sitting there and pressing all kinds of buttons and having a little stylus and then wearing out that the left inside and a little drawback because you're playing a game on it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and just sitting in the bus or the train or at, at a Starbucks somewhere, playing that everybody was always looking over your shoulder. What is that thing? And like, why what is it is cool? That? You know? Oh, yes. Totally. Spending hours learning how to write graffiti is a useless skill That's today. The- <laughs> That's exactly where I was going to go. I was like, oh, it seems so cool. But, man, you got to learn how to write that graffiti. Oh my <laughs> that God, was a little bit of a, of a training wheel moment. Yeah, yeah. So believe it or not, Ecamm, where I currently work, uh, their first application was a Palm Pilot app. Oh, you no know? kidding. Yeah. And uh, remember, what was it called? Active Sync or HyperSync in order mm-hmm. to put your podcast onto your palms so that you can walk around. Oh, boy. The hugest device ever to listen to a podcast on, which is funny because half my podcasts now come from my watch. <laughs> 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 Streaming from your watch. Is your watch internet connected? Like, or yeah, yeah, Well, yeah. of course it's internet connected, but does it have it o- its own mobile? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have the Ultra yeah. with, the, with the AT&T connected. So, but it's just super funny to think about how oh, totally. big a podcast device that was. But how it started was we were talking about like some of the origins of RSS. And I was telling Leo that, hey, my first um, player was the Compact Rio 300 or Diamond, Diamond, Diamond Diamond, Rio 300. And then later on, uh, Creative Labs bought it, Sound Blaster bought it, you know? Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. it's really funny how most people forget that because after the coin the phrase podcast came out, people start connecting it to the iPod. To the iPod. The iPod is five years later. Like it's a whole five years later and nobody really thinks about that. And then kind of the first podcast that made like muggles, no podcasting would be serial, which is 2013, 14. That was many years later. That was totally. like 10 years later. So only mm-hmm. pretty much 
you know, us iPodder X OGs who knew how to download this thing to build our little, you know, OPML file or XML file so we can get what we needed. And you had to hand code everything. M- the muggles, totally. weren't even, muggles were nowhere near this. And now it's crazy because there's millions of podcasts and new ones every day. And my job oh, is traveling so... around the country and speak at podcasting events. So it's kind of hilarious to me how far we've come. That's amazing. That's amazing. That brings up so many memories of the pre iPod era. And by the way, the show has begun at this point. This is, <laughs> this is the stuff that I love talking about. So <laughs> it's, it's great to it's great to have you on, Sean uh, Doc Rock. Do you do you care if people call you Sean or call Pretty you Doc Rock? Do you the, have a, pr- a preference? Only the police and the FBI call me that. <laughs> call you Sean? <laughs> yeah, I was a, I was a paramedic in the army, and yeah. The uh, my old DJ name was DJ Yogi. I have no idea where that came from. I, that one I have no idea where it came from. <laughs> you but didn't pick what, it, or you I just didn't picked pick it, very it. It was a, you know you know how the friends norm, normally your friends yeah. pick your DJ name. But this lady <laughs> who was a nurse who worked in my ambulance crew, her name was Mrs. Ohia. She used to call me Doctor Rock and Roll because I couldn't wait for my shift to be over because I was DJing in Waikiki. And she used to be like, oh, here he comes, because I, I, was, I was always dragging the next day. If I had morning yeah. shift, I'm of totally course. dragging from, you know, working at the club. And then she's like, here he comes, Dr. Rock and Roll. He's going to be half asleep. I go, yeah, but you know, as soon as I pop the siren, I'm wide awake. Let's go. And so she used to tease <laughs> me that, and everybody used to call me Dr. Rock because of that. And then also in I the I mean, that Army, is a pretty epic DJ yeah, name. It's I mean, a cool it's a, name, right? It was yeah, way better yeah. than the Yogi thing. And also in the army, if you're the person that knows every spec and like measures your rank when you put it on your uniform, they call you Sergeant Rock because you're like a rock soldier, like you know all the regulations, everything by the book. Yeah, I was okay. I'm Virgo. So naturally I was that dude. Me too. <laughs> so it, <laughs> it, it kind of stuck together. <laughs> and that that's how the name became. It's super funny now. Oh, that's awesome, and it's lived with you to this day. So um, you, you, you said uh, you said DJing, and that just reminded me of the fact that my back in the early two thousands, I DJed for you know probably about five, six, seven years, somewhere around there, and uh, my DJ name came from my earliest email address, which was Raygun zero one, <laughs> and so I just ended up doing DJ Raygun for. What reason I don't oh know. My I thought it was God. So it when came I from an email address. How nerdy 2000s? is that? <laughs> when you see early 2000s ray gun, I think of ray tracing. You remember when uh, we thought that was like the coolest thing since sliced bread was like ray tracing? Uh, it took freaking cool. hours. And half the time it worked, half the time it didn't. But when yeah. you nailed something, like the first time you rendered the baby Luco lamp in a little red and white ball in yes, like yes. electronic <laughs> yes. arts. Um, I forgot what it was so, called, but it was on the Amiga. And then was, you would yes. ray trace and you'd be like, oh, my God, look I what I made. I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> I remember seeing that and wanting so bad to have an Amiga because because of that. Because that just that looks so future. It that looks so, so future. like cutting edge. And I want that on my screen, not in a magazine. Oh, my God. So I used to build uh, video toasters. So my first oh. Amiga was a 500, no, Amiga 128, then Amiga 500, Amiga 3000. But yeah, I used to build video toasters. That was like kind of my first really nerd job. That and soldering, <laughs> piggyback soldering chips onto the Commodore 64 to make it a 128. One pin at a time. One pin at a time. Like, ding, it's so stupid. <laughs> That's awesome. So, so you were doing video toasters. Who? What was the company that created the video toaster back then? Who were you working uh, New for? New Tech, the same New Tech oh, that you, oh, it's just you used New Tech. to use. Okay, yeah. That's how old. Well, they that are. explains a lot about kind of the trajectory of where you are now and what you have done over the years. That explains so much. Isn't that crazy? And, and know how much headaches you got from messing around with with the real the the modern day toaster. <laughs> mm. But yeah, that was those guys all the way back then, like a garage startup, turned into wow. this thing that's used in broadcast every single day to this very day. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, my earliest kind of interaction with that technology was. For the, well, no, it wasn't a twit. It was a CNET. And it was the little SD kind of like, I, I don't know, probably like a, the size of a small stack of books. Yeah. And, you know, we were running our podcast studio off of that, uh, that new tech device or the TriCaster device. And now you see the, the, the modern TriCasters. And I mean, they are set like those control boards are massive and they're, 
yeah, there's probably, I mean, that's, that's probably running the show because it's so inexpensive running the show in a lot more places than the real big kind of grass Valley switching boards. The grass Valley switches are, Oh yeah. my God. That's where I first learned to cut was on grass Valley switcher. And those things were like pretty psycho. And my, my yeah. dad, he's broadcast professional, which is how I kind of got into it. Um, he was really good friends with John who started Aja video. Oh, okay. And Aja is technically Asia, but no one says Asia is, they say Aja, but it's Asia because it's named after his daughter. It's named after John's daughter. But John comes from uh, GVG, Grass Valley Group. Okay. And then he left to start his own thing. Man, Isn't you're that like crazy? Embedded in this whole broadcast world. Man, I was, I was I just no a little idea. kid cutting with actual, you know, one inch or umatic tapes, and yeah. So I've been around video for quite a long time, which is why I love when podcasting came out. I knew what I wanted to do from way back then was bridge the gap between the high technical side of what it is to make it more approachable to regular people. And it's kind of funny that I'm still doing that to this very day. I'm trying to yeah. like unmystify podcasting because conversations like this are so much better than the crap that comes on TV. So <laughs> I can listen to a two to four person interview on YouTube over anything on TV any day, just out yeah. of pure nosiness of what goes on in people's worlds. Yeah, and, for sure. And compare that to just the dumb stuff that's on TV. You know, there's a couple cool shows. Most of them are either really, really huge, high budget, or really, really low budget, and they're awesome because they're low budget. Mm -hmm. I feel like everything in the middle, just like black, I can take it or leave it. So I've always thought that, you know, even people with our experience, for us to be able to go into our house, a couple hundred dollars worth of stuff, and kind of sort of recreate what we used to work in studios with millions of dollars, oh, oh yeah. best, best thing in the world. Best thing oh, I mean, technology and, and the progress of technology and the democratization of all of these tools just because that price has driven down. The tech has expanded to the point where you can do so much with a single device. I mean, a smartphone is a prime example. Like you could you could do so much of this stuff with just a smartphone if you wanted to. There, there are yeah. levels beyond that, but that's so empowering. And yet, you know, I think at this point we probably all take it for granted because it's just, it's just is, you know, the oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It almost seems semi-normal. And it's funny yeah. because I, I oftentimes tell people when I'm doing like Ecamm support, I'm like, you know, the stuff that we're doing literally when I was in the industry, it would have been like two and a half million dollars worth of equipment. Mm -hmm. You got a $600 Mac mini and a $150 mic and you're doing what used to cost us. And that's just equipment, fam. Cables. Anybody that comes from broadcast will tell you all the money is in cables. It's just a metric ton of cables. <laughs> and the fact that most of this is one, you know, USB-C, you know, slash right. firewire cable, mind-blowing to me. <laughs> as simple as it gets. Right. As simple as it gets. Right. I mean, well, within the realm of the complicated world of technology. Uh, it's just most of the hard work has been done for us at this point, and we don't have to pay very much for it, thankfully. <laughs> that's, yeah, it, that's it awesome. makes a big difference. It makes a yeah. big difference. So, okay, so I usually, you know, getting getting prepared for conversations like this, you know, go online, just kind of see what I can find and everything I'm like scared. that. Uh, no, don't be scared. I saw that you were a break dancer when you were a kid. Yes. Oh yeah, my knee still hurt to this very day because of it. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me a little bit about that because when I was a kid, I I wanted to be a break dancer badly, but of course, I you know it that didn't. It was that, just that something future was to not do. Mine. Honestly, it was something to do, and um, I kind of just I, I I remember watching um, Breaking this movie uh, back in yeah, the day I that one. Mm -hmm. and i was like oh i'm gonna do that and so me and my friends we would just watch it over and over and try to emulate the moves and then we would go to there's this kind of like amphitheater that's connected to a rec center which is right across from this elementary school and we used to practice on the little stage until we got chased out every day and yeah it just started out from dancing and then from dancing it was trying to create our own music tracks so that we can build routines that match the music tracks. Ah, Similar to like if nice. you watch Jabberwockies today, yeah. and they're like, you're the only one that played an instrument, so you're in charge. And I'm like, huh? 
I got to do that? And they're like, yeah. And they said, oh, plus you have a computer. And I was like, oh, okay. So I had an Atari AST4. Okay. And I remember going to the store and like, hey, man, what's a MIDI? <laughs> and the guy <laughs> explained it to thing? me. Oh, boy. And yes. I was like, uh. <laughs> And then I remember <sighs> buying like the first MIDI interface and then a keyboard and soon after samplers came out. So in a way, my DJ career started because of dancing and my friends would be like, you're the only one that's a nerd. So you can figure out this making the music tracks for our dancing. And that's what now, mind you, it. music's pretty darn important in this whole equation. But whatever, 100%. none of us know or want to do it. You yeah, do it. So you your take job. care of it. I'm like, thanks. So that's kind of and so in a way, that's funny. That's I so got cool. heavy into computers because of music. Mm -hmm. And then later on, I got into design, which probably led me in a video. I got into design from trying to make our flyers and t-shirts and, you know, back making a zine back in yeah. the day was the coolest thing you can do. Right. Oh yeah. So, so trying to make the, the, the dancer zine that had all of the cool songs. These songs are coming out. These from New York, this from Chicago. Um, these are movies did you, you got to go watch kind of stuff. Did so, you yeah. get free music as a result of your zine? Did you get yeah, once I, any music? Once I, once I got into uh, radio, I started as an intern yeah. in radio and then I got on oh, every Friday, the DJ pool opened into records for hours on hours. We would sit on the oh, floor man. and open new music. That's the like greatest thing since true. sliced bread. Oh my God. So much fun. As a, as a DJ, that's like, that's, that's. Top top of the level, top of 100%. the hundred percent right there. The DJ Pool records every Friday. Oh, that's the best. And hearing stuff before anybody else hears it, oh, absolutely the coolest. <laughs> yep, yep, exactly. Oh, that's so cool. Immediately, I've learned so much about you. And it, like when I came across the breakdancing thing, I was like, I don't know how to ask this and have it have anything to do with technology. So I'm just gonna ask it and hope that it has some. It's sort It's funny of that it did, and though, it totally right? does. <laughs> Well, because you got to remember back then, the best way to cut stuff used to be sit there with your tape deck and you're sitting on the radio and you're trying to time the. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. it, and it either mm -hmm. worked or it didn't. So when yep. computers got the ability to record and make that process easier, oh, it was like somebody opened up the sky and just let the angels out. Like yep. that was literally the coolest thing because before it was just sit there and wait. And if you missed it, you had yep. to wait an hour, 20 minutes until it came back around in rotation and all yeah. of the commercials. There's no Spotify. There's, you know what I mean? You had to sit there and wait for the song. And like you could be you in the kitchen and you hear, oh, oh, you got to run in and try to catch it. <laughs> like, oh, it was it was it was wholly dramatic. So it's <laughs> yeah, in a way, that's it. The, the dancing sort of led to me being a nerd. That's amazing. That's amazing. Are you still uh, active in, in making music uh, using your computer? No, to make music now, my, now my music is put on the Apple Vision Pro and use the Algorithm DJ app just to you oh, know, okay. c calm my nerves. But I, yeah. I, re I retired from DJing about three to four weeks or oh, three to four months before the pandemic hit. Oh, so I, I, had, I had knee surgery in that November. So that was I couldn't, you know, work at that point. And by the time I was able to stand up, I was like, okay, I could go back to work. But then I was like, I don't really want to. So I'm like, yeah, I'm not coming back. I'm gonna think about this. And then two weeks later, uh, you guys gotta stay in the house for two weeks. And that was three yeah. years. <laughs> so <laughs> so by that time oh. I started to realize I didn't miss it when yeah. I could get up on Sunday at a normal time and you know, my knees weren't hurting anymore and I wasn't half deaf. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah yeah i, I, I mean, occasionally it's a, miss it's the a music lifestyle. i still listen to the music and try to keep up on the music side of it but i don't i don't miss the being in the just environment full of crazy people i hear you i completely uh get you and it's been a long time since since i like dj'd in an environment like that like very long time but every once in a while i get that urge to like and, and now you can do it all on your computer again, just yeah. like everything, right? Like yeah. when I was DJing way back in the day, you know, it was stacks of vinyl and it was, you had to have all this big equipment. And now you can just load up a software and have a stack of audio files and it knows how to beat match. Like it does all this stuff for you. It does you, all this which, stuff for you. I, and you know yeah. what? Getting algorithm on, uh, well, just DJ, what they call it, but the company's yeah. algorithm. Yep. Putting it on your iPad, and just having fun by yourself with a cup of coffee 
it's still good. Like, yeah, it's just totally. a very, and it gives you an opportunity to dig into the crates and find like older stuff or play around and do yep. experiments. Yep. It is a very good, calming, and relaxing thing. And I still, I still like finding gems. And the other thing that I still do, which drives everybody around me crazy, I can be listening to a song and I either know where the sample came from, <laughs> right? Because now everybody steals everything. Mm-hmm. Or oh, yeah. I'll start like automatically mixing a whole different song in that, and I'll be saying that part while this other song is on. And mm-hmm. then my other half, she just looks at me like, "Would you stop that? I'm trying to enjoy this song." I'm like, "Sorry, it's a, it's just an automatic <laughs> habit." So then, next thing you know, I'm in the living room and I'm playing them both together, you know, in the living room. And she's like, "Okay, I can see where you're going with that." I know, I know, this like, is gonna work. Off. Yeah, I know this is gonna work. Oh, totally. So I, just, yeah. I start I still beat matching in my head just from like yeah. random things, but yeah, kind of funny. <laughs> That's cool. I have not played around with the algorithm software. It's well, so I have much not. Fun. Well, I mean, I, mean I, I many years ago when I was still at Twit, actually, we had the algorithm um, people on all about Android at the time, and they had a big hardware controller. There's one of their earlier hardware controllers with you know, two large decks or whatever um, that, that integrated with their software. And so I had played around with it then, but that was many years ago. That was probably like 27. They just, so I, they just uh, introduced a combination with Pioneer. And I'm like, yo, I don't need to spend this 500 bucks right now, but I kind of oh, want one. But- yeah, <laughs> birthday's coming totally. up in a week. I'm like, uh, do I treat myself to a new controller that I'm never taking anywhere? <laughs> totally. Yes, I, I so definitely experienced that with DJ technology specifically. Yes, and there, so there is this new one. It's only about yo big, and I, there's one by Hercules and one by Panasonic slash Pioneer, which you can just take on a plane with your iPhone. Yeah, and I'm like, I'm in the plane a lot. Yeah, I might buy this. It's only like 120 bucks. <laughs> yeah, yep, and it's a small so, miniaturized. Yes, I've I've actually yeah. played with one of those. Um, oh I think God. I reviewed it for Twit, probably in like 2018 or whatever. And what it did is it inspired me to because I used to also write music for you know for like dance clubs and stuff like that back in the early 2000s. So it inspired me to pull out a lot of that music that I wrote and do like a virtual DJ mix with just my music using. That thing, and that's that's what like this technology. Like I'm not DJing, but at all anymore. But I see something like that. And I'm like, well, I guess I could spend a couple of hundred dollars on that. Like it would only be for me, but still, it's so much fun to do that process. So here, here's a takeaway for anybody listening at home or watching this on you know later date. One thing about being a creator and how you avoid creator's block is always create, even if it's not in the current creating echelon that you're using to you know like make money or market in or whatever so like at this point in time both of us are basically youtubers Mm -hmm. but i find it's still important for me to write right i find it's still important for me to play around with my music and stuff and i am horrible with the paintbrush but i will pull out the watercolors thing and just move paint around on this piece of paper you know clown it with my niece because a creator needs to create at all given points in time. So I practice creativity in the kitchen. I practice mm-hmm. creativity with my stupid, I like to make up my own lyrics for songs. Completely mm-hmm. drives the old lady crazy because she's normally the subject matter of some of these songs. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Love it. But I, I feel like you have to do that. And I find that what a lot of creators do is like they're a video creator, so they try to only create videos. They get locked in. They lock themselves in. And you get locked in. in. And then the way yeah. that's actually blocking you. So the best way to remain creative as a human is to constantly create. And I also mm-hmm. tell my students who are like, well, I'm having a hard time doing this, this, and this. I go, no, you're an excellent creator. They're like, well, how so? I'm like, because you're right now, you're really good at creating excuses. <laughs> good one good one so, i'm sure that finds a finds oh, a way oh, that, once that, every year that gets them <laughs> <At least. laughs> that, get, that gets them <laughs> like oh yeah i guess i am uh yeah that's <clears throat> i i realize in my life that pr- that making music is really important to me yet i allow everything else to to take priority, right? Especially right now. Like right now, it's like prime directive. Got to create content online. Got to make this business work. Jury's still out on whether that's actually going to happen in the long run. But 
finding the time to then put it into my most pa- passionate creative uh, creative outlet is really hard. It's hard to find the time. What, All right, what I is got your one answer for you. That? I got yeah. one for you. It's perfect. The next time you have to do some ideation for yeah. topics for the show, guests you should talk to, whatever. Yeah. Um, put your phone on the table, press on voice notes, and then instead of just spitting the notes out loud, pull off one of those strats off the wall or that Taylor Gibson. I can't tell by the fret <laughs> if it's a Taylor or Gibson. Pull that sucker down and strum while you're thinking. Yeah, yeah. I guarantee you more thoughts Good come idea. out. When your hands are doing what your hands know how to do automatically, more yeah. thoughts will come out. I find if I need to ideate, I have to do beats on the table. Pisses everybody off at Starbucks. But I more, <laughs> like I, hands it, on the table, rat yeah, attack like, sort of thing. My head's bobbing. Yeah. I'm thinking. I stop. Yeah. I write down what I got to write down. And if I ideate with that flow, it completely works. You, you more know, stuff comes out because that's how your brain is wired, bro. Yeah. Is either well, that or my brain else, is wired right? with Japanese whiskey? <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on the situation. Um, no, but but I think you're you're right, and I know you're right actually because how many times have I been doing something else? Actually, today, just today, I you know every Tuesday I have a standing kind of Pilates appointment. It's something I do every week to keep myself healthy and and whatever. And always, it's the hour of time that it's like it's not the most entertaining hour of my life, but I do it because I know it's good for me and guaranteed through that hour, I'm going to have 10 or 12 things that pop into my mind that the second that I'm done, I can't remember, but it was brilliant. I wish I had written it down. And it's that same thing. It's like you detach your brain. So are you attended or unattended? Is somebody pushing you or are you using the machines? Oh, I've got, well, there's a Pilates instructor. It's a, it's a group class. So there's a Pilates oh, a group instructor. Oh, see, that's harder in she's, a group class. Because if you're on the machine well, by yourself. she's telling us what to do, but yeah. You could um, take your AirPod, trigger it real quick, and just tell Siri. Yeah, yeah. And do that appending nose. Because <laughs> where it kills me, the wor- I'm driving, I can't write it down. Or I'm yep. in the, sh- oh, stop that. <laughs> or I'm in the yep. shower, and I can't write it down. So I've learned to tell homegirl over there, I'd be like, hey, girl. Uh, I got this idea completely unflushed, but just write this down. And so yep, now yep. with the with the advancements in Apple Intelligence coming up next week, or yes. even with uh, the Google Assistant, you can take a voice memo. So without yep. touching your your phone, your device, your speaker, you can take a voice memo. Please let it out then, because if mm-hmm. you don't, after this your hard. certain Once vintage, it's gone. It's gone. <laughs> It's completely yeah. gone. So I actually <laughs> bought a Plod because of this, and I actually use it because it saves. It, Plod is really flat, like audio recorder that goes in the back of your phone. Uh, P L A U D. Oh. Um, it looks like a, a oversized field notes or slightly smaller, and it fits in the little booty hole in the back of this case. And I can okay. just press record and just talk, and then it writes it down for me. Um, it will do. Is it will? Oh, that's new. That hasn't come out yet. But that's what I got—the gray one. What it will do oh, okay. is it will use AI to write it back into a normal human sentence. Sometimes oh. I let it do that. Sometimes I just need the MP3 so I can listen to it myself, so I can write my own what? notes down. <clears throat> because yeah, now we're in a position because we're always doing so many things. We don't mm-hmm. always have our field notes, which I still carry around too, and. I don't know if you remember this. Back in the day, Evernote used to have a sticker. It says, I'm not ignoring you. I'm taking notes. <laughs> I and don't remember I that, but that's good. Always bust this out of my back pocket in the middle of doing something. I start writing something down. My friend's like, what are you writing down? Nothing. If I don't write it down, at this age, bro, it's gone. So leave me alone. Let me write it down. Don't interrupt yeah. me when I'm writing this down. Otherwise, I'm jacked. Yep. Yep. There was the oh, 80s man. happened and things happened in the 80s which messed up my memory. Let it go. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. I can identify. Uh, that is so cool. I love that uh I love that reminder because it's it, time and time again. I mean, we're all, age comes for all of us and as I get older, I find it harder and harder to focus in on that that brilliant or or cool idea or whatever if i don't act on it it's completely gone so really you need to get a three four pack of field notes or even buy the cheapest ones you can find yeah Uh, muji makes incredible notebooks one in every room and you tell everybody in the house never remove these from this room because Mm -hmm. i swear like you said it's like the curse of creative people 
the ideas come to you when you can't do nothing about it. It does. And, you know? And so yep. when you hear stories, like I, I'm with you, I like to listen to origin stories. When I hear uh, Ryan Reynolds say, I was in a restaurant having a bowl of broccoli cheese soup and the concept of Deadpool 2, where I wanted to take it, came to me. So I just asked the waiter for a napkin and I wrote the bones down on a napkin while I was eating, you know, something. This happens all the time. If you listen to uh, that, that thing that we all know as the Phil Collins in the air of the night riff, complete accident, complete riffing. And what most people don't know, if you take the time to listen to the lyrics, they make not one bit of sense. Because you, as a music creator, knows sometimes you just mumble words in order to Total. find the melody. Yes. They recorded that. He had every intention on and going back and writing a song. When they were looking to fill a song, they took that and they said, okay, we're going to write it. So they built the, the, the sound. They built the phonic qualities. And they're like, yeah, this is great. And Phil's like, but I need to. And it was never supposed to come out. But it came out, his most iconic song. Lyrics don't go. make a damn bit. There were mumbles for the melody finding. And that gated snare was a miswiring of cables. It wasn't intended to that. So the gated snare that we all love from the 80s oh, came from that yeah. accident. That, that was, Two things were never supposed to happen in that song. Most iconic song from Genesis slash Phil Collins ever. Sometimes the most memorable thing, at least in, in my experience with music, is the thing you didn't intend on. It's that random 100%. little blip or that random moment. And, you know, and, and especially nowadays in the realm of, of music creation, the tools are so good that we can get perfect everything. And along with that perfection comes the removal of mistakes and moments like that, potentially. It's like, oh, well, that's not perfect, therefore... It's out. I think that's where a lot of people that that don't appreciate where music is at right now. I think that's a big part of the reason why, because the, the, the humanity is gone when we have the ability to fix everything. One thing oh, that came up, and then and then I got to take a quick break, and then we'll come back and talk a little bit about more uh, uh, more about what we're <laughs> where we're going because I love that it's super random and it's great. Um, is a book called Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert. And it's uh, creative living beyond fear. And I only bring this up because some of what you've been talking about is encapsulated in this book. It's a fascinating oh, book, kind I of about the creative it. mind and the creative process. But what really struck me about what you were saying and what's in the book is that as a musician, as one example in the, that she gives in the book, um, she kind of likens it to when an idea, a song idea appears in our head, this is an idea that actually has the ability to leave us and go into somebody else. So are you willing to capture it and to do something with it before it becomes somebody else's great idea? And that's ever since reading it, that's really stuck with me. And it's been a constant reminder for me, like when I've got a great idea, like capture it because that idea might go to somebody else somewhere down the line. And hey, it was my idea. It was here first. Bro, so. that is it. Look, you just cost me an audible credit. <laughs> All right, do it. It's a fantastic book. It it's called done. Big Magic. It is already on my way to the phone. That is super right good. On. And, and my, in my community, my friends crack up laughing with me. Because I have the worst case of musical Tourette's known to man. And I tell them I can't help it. I legit have been playing records since I was 14. Yeah, so yeah. It's embedded. When, in when you said, like, are you ready to capture it? My brain in my head is going, din, 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 din. I'm doing, I'm doing <laughs> Eminem. Palms are sweaty. <laughs> you know, it just happens instantly. And I love this kind of thing because you're right. Like those triggers, you really got to you got to get to them as soon as you can. Uh, uh, yeah. David, David, um, oh my God, Alan was like, your brain was not meant to hold these things. Your brain was meant to just create them, and you got to let them out. So he was the one that says write down everything as soon as you come to it, and that's why we call it capture. Probably from his GTD system. Like I think yeah. that word sticks everywhere because of him, and you, you just never know the impact you're going to have on someone. So thank you for the tip. Indeed. I love it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we're going to take a quick break, come back, talk a little bit more uh, with Doc Rock. All right, Doc. So, um, 
you were talking a little bit earlier about being being a kid and having you know your dad working in in broadcast and everything. And I guess the question that comes up for me is, as a kid with that kind of access, like I certainly didn't have that kind of access. My dad was not involved in technology at all, so I had to be the one to like get the 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 you know the portable speaker and take it apart and figure out the wiring and do all that stuff on my own like what was your experience as a kid having a, a father who worked and did everything that he did in technology like how did that I don't know how did that supercharge your childhood and in, in okay so this is this is awesome all right so my my paternal father um, was a truck driver um, mm -hmm. But when I left home in my teens, I came to Hawaii and I was adopted by this Korean family. And my Korean dad is a broadcast guy. Okay, so I have the rich dad, poor dad experience. But my okay. Korean dad wasn't any, not that much richer than my, my blood father. <laughs> However, one of the things that my blood father and my grandfather put me on to was when I was a little kid, my first ever, like, prominent gift that wasn't made by Fisher Price was a tool set and erector set. So you mentioned the part about taking things apart. Yo, I started taking stuff apart when I was a little kid. I used to take apart the TV, take apart the record players, take apart the A track. Yes, I'm that old. Um, and put things back together. And I remember building like my own little radio that could, this company called ESPN started up in Connecticut, Bristol, Connecticut. And I had got a CB radio slash ham radio set up from my grandpa. And I remember playing around with that and wiring an antenna from a Zenith book. If you remember Zenith, they used to have mm -hmm. heat kit. It's like Radio yep. Shack. I remember wiring an antenna and I was getting ESPN signals on this little black and white TV we had in our house. It was horrible, but it kind of worked. And you could see college football game. And then once my grandfather saw that I had that kind of acumen, government jobs were starting to get computers and they were, you know, issuing the Snoopy calendars on dot matrix. My family knew that I had a proclivity to this. So I got a trash 80 when I was a 10, maybe eight, 10. Uh, TRS 80. Sorry, we call it trash 80 now. No, I, um, I got you. <laughs> so even my even my poor family saw that I had a technical acumen and they enforced it. Like they got me things or somebody in the family would be like, hey, this blender stopped working. Can you figure it out? And they would just give it to me. It's like you get it to fix. Cool. If you don't get it to fix. Cool. Because it's dead anyway. And right. then next thing you know. I'm like, mom, how do you make a pina colada? She's like, what do you know about pina colada? I don't know. I see. I heard the song on the radio and I fixed Auntie's blender. <laughs> and then she's like, first of all, it has alcohol. You can't have that. Oh, shouldn't have told me that. <laughs> so, <laughs> but like people in my family or the neighborhood would just give me broken stuff and then I would fix it. And that kind of built that. So when I got here, how I found my career in that is I was here by myself and I walked into this electronic store looking for a capacitor. And we were talking and he's like, oh, you're in the army? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, I'm ex-army. And he told me like he was from engineering corps. I was in the medical corps. We often work tight together. And then he was like, I have a, a teenage son who is like kind of internal, but he could use a big brother. Somebody like you that will show him the roads. Anything I tell him, he won't listen. But he kind of knew that my army training, his army training, we had a similar principle. But like, if I tell the little brother something, it's cool. If dad tells the little brother something, it's, you know, uh, insert six letter that. <laughs> so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. he kind of was like, if you don't, would you mind? I was like, oh, absolutely. I haven't, you know, any friends here yet. I'm brand new. And like, literally, we became the best of friends. And they kind of adopted me because my mom wanted me to return back to the mainland. But it was 85. And New York, D.C., 85 was not a good place to be. So we kind of convinced her to let me stay here. And then he's like, I'll make sure that he has a job and make sure he finishes college. You know, when he finishes the army, I'll make sure he stays out of trouble. And my mom was like, yo, come back to the block and, you know, get into all myriad forms of ill repute or stay here and sort of work in something that she knew I was really into. So I started working mm -hmm. at the store and selling 
commercial equipment, broadcast equipment, consumer electronics. So basically, I was selling TV, stereos, radios, uh, Sony broadcast cameras, recorders, and you know even Grass Valley switchers. Like I sold Grass Valley switchers. So wow, I, this I, is a store that had literally everything. Then. Yeah, it was called you Video don't Life. Go, go into any tech tech store and find Grass Valley switchers. You know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. So because they so well. He always supported the broadcast industry because that's where he came from. But then being always busy doing that, like, you know, mom would be mad. Like, why are you always, you know, back and forth to Japan and Korea? Like, what, what are you doing? And he goes, I know how to keep her busy. Let's sell TVs and VCRs and stuff because he made relationships with people at Sony and JVC and Panasonic. So she handled the, the consumer side and then we handled the broadcast side. And so even being slightly older, Myself and my my little brother June, we got to help him with the pro stuff, and we basically hired workers to do the consumer stuff. Although we did consumer mm -hmm. stuff whenever it was slow season, so or Christmas, mm -hmm. every, all hands on deck during Christmas, right? Yeah, <laughs> and then, yeah, uh, yeah. The funniest thing I ever did out of that process, though, is um, I discovered uh, what happens when your fonts are miskerned. Because I used to build the store ad full page oh, no. ad in in Quark oh, no. Express. Uh -huh. And Sony, we had this thing where you would do these uh, really cheap products, uh, the lowest end of a Sony device in the line to get people in the store. And Sony would pay for the ad. And then normally people would see the cool stuff and buy more Sony stuff. So Sony was very brilliant. So we had this VCR and it's going to be like uh, $119 on Sunday, right? And they give us like 50 of them and use those as lost leaders to get bodies in the store. And I wanted to do everything in Helvetica because I was a new designer and Helvetica was cool. Turns out the Helvetica that ships with Windows is not the same as the Helvetica that shipped with Apple. So I turned in my ad and it was an $11 VCR. <laughs> we show up to the store on Sunday. Oh There's a line no. around the freaking block. And then oh, no. I pull up fresh from the club, kind of a little bit hangover. I'm like, yo, say yo. And my mom was like, Pablo sick. Yeah, which is like, Korean for you stupid ass. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what? And so we had to let them all go. And luckily, Sony helped us cover it. But we had to sell all of the VCRs. So everybody got $11, $11 VCRs out of it. Because you have to honor it. But... That's when I first learned Bam. that all fonts ain't treated equal and flatten your files, never send an EPS or a PostScript file that's not just curves so that nobody can edit it. Yeah, I learned a whole <laughs> bunch of mistakes that day. I thought I was going to get killed. <laughs> oh, I bet. that. Yes, that, that. I'm sure that the discovery at that point was the heart sinking to your feet feeling. Right? Anybody that's ever feeling. been bihexual knows that Arial Mac and Arial PC used to be completely different. I think they're similar <laughs> now. I think uh, OTF fonts have kind of fixed that but back in the yeah, day they were absolutely sort of different universal. yeah wow now when you say here versus mainland where in hawaii are you for people honolulu who don't know? i live honolulu. roughly a mile away from waikiki okay okay would you say that the technology experience living and growing up in hawaii was very different from say the mainland oh, I, mean, 100%. I imagine things were way more expensive but uh, expensive you know, yes too. but it's actually faster because of the pro okay two things to know about hawaii the proximity to asia is closer it's only a nine-hour mm, flight mm. Okay. the other thing is we have probably the largest asian diaspora away from the asian countries in Hawaii. So Hawaii is like 60 some odd percent Japanese, right? Mm. So we get the thing, you remember when Japan was just running tech? We had everything mm. here months, sometimes years before mainland US got it. Oh, okay, right? that makes sense. And then same yes. thing with Korea and same thing with China. So we would get things way earlier. Like now import racing is very, very big in the continent in the US. But we were doing import racing in Hawaii since the early 80s. You know, the JDM things or watching anime. I, and people watch anime now. They're like, oh, I just started watching this. I'm like, yeah, that's old. No, it's not. It's brand new. No, it's not. <laughs> like, so, uh, yeah, Hawaii has always had a faster connection just because there's so many people that travel back and forth. And even me now, yeah. I'm back to Japan like two, three times a year. Yeah. Wow. No, that's that's true. You do a lot of travel. Is would you say Japan is the place that you go? Oh, that's my home. Most? <laughs> I, that's your home. I was I was born Japanese in a different lifetime or something. <laughs> I love that place <laughs> so so much. Like it's it's just fun. The food is good. Uh, this the the quality to me. All right. 
I'm very much into balance, which I guess is yeah. in of itself a Japanese thing. Uh, they always talk about balance. And the coolest thing to me about Japan is like when I'm in Kyoto, I'm in the middle of a major modern metropolitan 15 minute bus ride, country, silence. Just mm-hmm. enjoy. Mm-hmm. Just get right back in the bus, go back to the city. Like, it's hard to do that because we, we have the most space. But we tend to put the space far away from the cities. They Mm -hmm. put the space next to the city because you need to go there more often. So even New York is cool because you got Central Park, you got, you know, Bryan Park, you got places you can go. A lot of cities, they just build so much that there's no even like good parks. And some of the parks are so in the city, they haven't figured out how to build a separation. Mm -hmm. In Japan, in the middle of the city, like in, in Tokyo, You'll build Ueno Park, and you can see the skyscrapers because they're big, but I swear the park is almost silent. It's like, how do they do that? It's like the way they plant the trees to the outside, and there's a little buffer zone. And when you're in the park, you're in the park. And they take well care of it, and it's designed to give you a place to disconnect. And Love learning that. that in my college days, I am very good at disconnecting and you know, kind of going somewhere. Yeah, have you ever taken a break from technology? Have you ever disconnected from, you know, you're talking about disconnecting from the chaos of a city to go to a park. Have you ever applied that to your technical or technological world? I think yes and no. Um, I totally disbelieve in, oh, you got to put all the phones down and turn off and run away from social media. No, you don't. (laughs) You just have to control what you absorb. I think most people don't realize, everyone loves to use the word algorithm but don't really know what it means. But for those of us that went to school and took calculus or whatever and we understand algorithms, um, the platforms are only designed for you to enjoy more of what you say you love. And even if you don't say it, your behavior will tell it that this is what you love. Or it inspires something in you, good, bad, or indifferent. Mm -hmm. The platform for the me as an ad buyer, right? I'm going to buy ad for my product. It's designed to make sure that Jason watches as much of this platform as possible so he has more chance of seeing my ad, right? So if you create content in a manner where you are the procuring cause of a person's positive experience on YouTube, like you're going to create this video. Someone's going to see our conversation. Like those two old guys are funny. Let me watch something else with two old guys on it. And another thing with two old guys on it. If you can create somebody to sit on a YouTube platform for five hours, YouTube will promote your videos. Tech Exploder mm-hmm. to Exploder. See, Tech Exploder will be one of the number one videos on YouTube because you're creating a curiosity tunnel or we all call rabbit hole. If you can be right. the person that creates the rabbit hole to keep a person's butt in the chair on the platform for a long time, they will promote that. If you make content for YouTube and you say, uh, leave YouTube and go to my site and buy my stuff and look at my things, you just took somebody out of Google's mall to a place where Google can't make any money. Google doesn't support that because that's not how they make money, which is why you'll notice if you search for something nowadays after the sponsor content, the first three responses are YouTube videos because they know that the video would nine times out of 10 answer that person's question. They also know that nobody watches one video and turns it off. Nobody. Hmm. You haven't done that in forever and try it. Next time you say, I'm going to just watch this answer. And then you're like three more of the same. You want to make sure this person is right. So you watch three more videos. Right, yeah, you got to verify. (laughs) Right? Trust and verify, (laughs) right? So unless you have premium, you end up getting like more ads. So Google is finding a way to keep you in the mall. So the reality is, if you want a pure, clean, fanciful social media experience, you need to create positive. You need to watch positive. And when you see something negative, swipe right past it. Don't let it trigger Mm -hmm. you. Don't let it ignore you. Don't let it suck you in. We don't care who said what or why they did it. Just move right past it and go to the cats. You watch the cats playing. Within three days, you will see nothing but cats playing. Yep. But the minute you Sounds stop right. and double take on the post because the the elephants and the donkeys are fighting about something stupid, it oh those work better. So let oh. me send you two hundred of those. Yeah, yeah. Right. It stop. So you need to watch. You need to watch a hundred happy posts 
in order to keep away two bad posts because the two bad posts will amplify. It's hard in the moment. It's hard to to, oh, yeah. to remember, to remind yourself, to keep moving Especially on, now, because you know? now it's yeah. there's a lot of false content being generated out there to trigger you. So just yeah. don't trigger any of it. Just ignore it. Like, if you want to yeah. watch that stuff, go purposely looking for it and maybe even make a dummy account to, to go engage that's in smart. that stuff. Because then yeah. your regular feed, that's your family feed, your friends, I want to see what my homies are doing, that feed stays clean. When you find yourself curious to find out what's popping off in the elephant donkey wrestling, then use a separate account for that. <laughs> oh, man. Yes, I, I hear you completely. That, that would all be uh, more effective if my younger daughter didn't have access to my YouTube on our TV set. That, <laughs> Because let me tell you, that skews things yes, it further does. than probably anything in my life. <laughs> yes, it does. Every once in a while, mother-in-law comes over and she starts. She forgets to switch to her account. I put her account exactly. on the TV, All but she'll forget to switch it. And I'll go in and I'm looking for soccer, football, and round football and oblong football. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, how to cook uh, ramen <laughs> or like how to make a Japanese fried chicken. And I'm like, lucky for you, I can understand Japanese, but otherwise my whole YouTube becomes Japanese. <laughs> and I'm like, mom, use your own account. Talk, say my saying. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I hear you. I hear you on that. I know that we're running out of time. Before we go, I do want to make sure that we get a little bit of a plug in for your Doc Pops. Thank because you. Because I, I, I love it when people who I appreciate and follow and um, just enjoy watching as I do you and everything that you do online uh, go a step further and actually create like a product. Like you created a product, dude. That's amazing. Yeah. Tell us about it. It was it was funny. So there was a company, they're out of Holland, and they used to sell covers for the SM7B. But as I yeah. travel around and teach podcasting and go to podcasting events, there's so many people that are like, Well, I have a MV7 or a pod mic, and those are the most common right now. And there was nothing really for those guys. Well, the other side of it is for a piece of foam that I could only order from the Netherlands, the shipping was like $60. The foam itself was like $30. And I was like, number one, uh, $30 is a little expensive for a piece of foam. And number two, yeah. $60 for shipping is just ridiculous. Now, maybe if you're in the East Coast, it's only $40. It's still stupid. <laughs> so yeah. I went to my friend and I goes, I want to make these. I want to make them better. I want to make them acoustically sound so they're not just shipping foam. And I want right. them to have really, really elaborate colors. And my buddy was like, I can help you with that. So he was my he was my program director when I was in radio, but he lives in China and he normally helps create Funko Pops. You know those little mm -hmm. weird dolls with the big eyeballs. Yep. And then so he started like uh, helping other people here who wanted to create stuff. So we had a conversation and he says I can help you do that. And so I just closed the first round of pre sales. Anybody wants to order, you still can order, but you'll probably see your thing in like the end of October because the first batch just went in. And now manufacturing started two days ago. That's so exciting. They're, they're being manufactured as we speak. I am finishing up the packaging right after this. And so I'm designing the packaging and I'm sending that over to them today. And hopefully like some of these first shipments will be coming out by the end of the month. And they'll ship from the factory directly to people. And I just can't wait. I just wanted to create something that allows you to have a little bit of style. Yeah, no kidding. And I mean, these are, you know, the colors are in super vibrant and you know they're they're, they're microphone pop filters at the and the color the names are totally me they're super stupid <laughs> it's just stuff that i made up uh, simply red that's from the music AF, yeah <laughs> blue hawaii pretty and pink insanity orange i think that's what how i pronounce that right yeah orange oh oh Orange, okay. And Purple Rain, R -E -I -G -N. So the, the orange is because of uh, Holland, Netherlands soccer team. They say orange is the mm -hmm. color of insanity is kind of the, um, the uh, saying for that team. And back when I was first playing soccer, Johan Cruyff was the best in the planet, and I was just in love with that dude. It was him and Pele. Everybody followed Pele, so I got to be different and follow Johan Cruyff. And I've been a Netherlands uh, national team fan since 12, maybe 10. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Well, um, 
people go to docmerch.com. Is that yes. the right URL? You can URL do either or. Docpops.com or docmerch.com, either or. Same and, thing. And it's docpops, P O P P S. Yes. I had just, to do two P's because the regular way was taken. <laughs> Yeah, that guy. That guy is a chiropractor, and his name is like Doctor Popovich. I was like, okay, dude, I'll, you can keep that one. I'm not even going to bug you. Can I buy it? That was just perfect. <laughs> I don't know. I like it with the two P's. To be honest, so do I. I think it, it gives it a little bit of that extra flair. It's you know what I mean. It's it's it forces it's you to do a little filter, bit of an, uh, It's a pop filter. It's a pop of color. Take. And at my age, yeah. more and more of my friends like to call me pops, so I can punch them. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> well, Doc Rock, you are awesome. I've always, um, I, you know, I've worked over the years up until last December at Twit, and we were always bringing you on Twit shows when I was producing the show. And you're one of my favorite guests all the time. Thank you. I just love your personality. You've got you've got a a lightness to your being in the world of technology. That's uh, I don't know that I really appreciate. So thank you. For thank doing you, what man. You do. I appreciate thank you for it. Teaching people because you do you, a lot of know, instruction. You do a lot of teaching. Jason, the thing is, most people take this stuff way too seriously. Mm -hmm. And like I told my students, you're going to go produce something. And if it fails, nine times out of 10, nobody's going to die. Right. Mm -hmm. So you can mm -hmm. just dust off and do it again. There's no reason to take this so serious that it takes the fun out. You know, and I watch people get in, in full heated conversations over Xbox versus PlayStation. And I'm like, really, dude? Really? I mean, like, just pick one and enjoy it and don't yuck the other person's because they don't have it. You know what I mean? So even something as minutia as the Android and iPhone, I watch people get in full heated arguments. I worked at Apple. I'm a hardcore Apple guy. I've used the Android like twice. But that doesn't mean I need to go and pee on your Wheaties because of it. Like, this is just a dumb thing. So I'm like, yeah. people should enjoy tech. And I think that's why so many people are afraid to get into tech is because of the gatekeepers. Sometimes yeah. we can act a little bit uninviting with the stupid conversations over green bubbles. And so that's why your friend doesn't want to be in tech because we're cantankerous half the time. So I just want to be inviting. Like everybody come in and have fun. It doesn't matter because even all of us nerds, we all started as the dummy in the bunch when I rolled into the store and asked the dude, what's a MIDI? He probably laughed under his breath too, but you know what he did? He helped me. And to this yeah. day, I know how to use MIDI. That's <laughs> so right. There's that. Right. There's it that. set the path. It set Correct. the path. Right on. Well, I love that message. I love that attitude around technology. There's a lot of, uh, you know, sky is falling and, uh, you know, bad bad feelings around technology, um, yet we all still are passionate about it. We all still love it. And it's nice to know that there are people out there like yourself who are bringing, who are keeping it fun and enjoyable. And uh, I put the yeah, fun in dysfunctional. There we, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> that works. Thank you, Doc. It's been so much fun getting to know you a little bit more. I appreciate you being here. Thank you. Aloha, brother. Huge thank you to our guest, Doc Rock. So great talking with Doc and learning a little bit about him that I just truly had no idea. Uh, everybody, we could not do this podcast without your support. That is the most direct way to support what we're doing with the Texploder podcast right now. All you have to do is go to Patreon at patreon.com slash Jason Howell. There, if you sign up, you'll get ad-free shows, early access to videos, a Discord community, an exclusive patrons-only pre-show live stream every single week, and more. We also offer the chance to be an executive producer of this show, and you'll get a t-shirt to wear as well, just like this week's executive producers, Bill Rudder, Jeffrey Maricini, John Cuny, and Taylor Sunderhaas. Put a fifth finger on my hand when I <laughs> when I count those down. Become an executive producer at patreon.com slash Jason Howell. We do this podcast every Thursday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. That's at least when it premieres. Uh, on the Texploder YouTube channel. And then we have the audio podcast, of course, publishing to the feeds uh, just a little bit later that day. You can really find everything you need to know about this podcast at texploder.com. Thanks again to our guest, Doc Rock. Thanks to you for watching and listening. I'm Jason Howell, and I'll see you next time on another episode of the Texploder podcast. Bye, everybody. Bye.